brought to you today by the ACRL Membership Committee. Um, this is going to be first in what we hope to be a series of webcasts on academic librarianship. So future ones will be planned that are more specific to maybe four-year institutions or community colleges. But today's session is going to be more uh, of a broad overview with some more in-depth sessions coming later. Um, we want to thank you, our members, um, and for those of you who are soon will be members with us, because this is a topic of interest that we've heard from you. Uh, and that's why we knew to bring this to the forefront. So thank you for this. Um, we need to know, like, how do, how do you get that first academic librarian position? How do we do that? So I'm going to advance these slides. We're going to get going on that today. Um, so you can see my name on there. And there's kind of a picture of me, right? I'm Rachel. I'm Head of Reference Services here at Michigan State University Libraries. Um, ACRL is my home division. Uh, I spent a lot of time in it, and I love being in it, and it's really helped me uh, as an academic librarian, and I hope you'll find some of that as well. If you have any questions today about anything uh, ACRL-related ACRL or about what our topic is today, please feel free to reach out. I would be happy to chit-chat with you. Um, we are going to be I'm, – I'm just moderating today, so I am not your, your primary speaker, and I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. We will be watching that chat, or at least I'll be watching that chat on the side of the screen to pick up some of those questions. But we are going to have a designated time at the end of, the, of this webinar for you to ask your questions. So you're welcome to ask them now, and we'll pick up like one or two, but we'll try to get to the bulk of them at the end if we don't hear from you right away. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our colleagues. Um, first up, we have Stephen Bell. He's an associate university librarian um, out at Temple, and that's out on the East Coast in Philly. And um, what I wanted to note about Stephen's information here is that Stephen wants to hear from you. So if you have any questions at all, if there's stuff where you are like, you know what, I heard this in the webinar and I need more, please, 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 please reach out to Stephen. His email address is there at bells at temple.edu. You'll see he's got a Twitter uh, handle there at, at blendedlib, and then he's got a website as well. Our, oops, wrong way, sorry about that. Our second, um, whoops, there we go, there we go. Okay, our second speaker, our second presenter on today's uh, panel is Melanie Hawks, who is a human resource manager at the Marriott Library at the University of Utah at melanie.hawks at utah.edu. And what's interesting about Melanie's position is that she is joint with the university HR system and in the libraries. So she can offer us a really interesting kind of back of the, back of the house view of what does it mean when you're actually going through this entire process. Super fun. This is going to be great. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Stephen now and let him tell you the beginnings of this story. Uh, let me see if I can pass that ball to him. One moment. And Stephen, you are good to go. Hi, everyone. This is Stephen. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we have a lot to cover, and, and given the different nature of our topic where you know hiring processes can vary quite a bit between you know, different institutions and libraries you know it may be that the situation that you encounter in your job hunt is going to be a little bit different than what you might hear today and I think that's a, why one of the great possibilities here is to have some uh, sessions that are more specific to different institution types that could be definitely helpful and you'll have opportunities for specific questions later on. We know we're not going to get to everything. As Rachel said, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can get to. But if uh, there's something that you don't hear in the session today, and if you want to get in touch with me, um, I'm very happy to hear from you. Um, but let's start by uh, sharing what our intended outcomes are for day, today. At the conclusion of the session, we intend for you to become familiar with the topics you see here on the slide. And with the focus on the job search process itself, which is primarily applying job ads in the interview. Now, as we'll probably note a few times in this session, the best source for job advice is often networking with library colleagues or a mentor. So you can learn more about the specific type of environment that you're interested in. And, and applying for a position there, or why you may or may not want to work in that particular type of library or that setting. 
So there's so many different types of situations. Uh, what I often suggest is you know, get in touch with a colleague, go out, visit libraries, learn more about them. I have rarely encountered a librarian who is not very enthusiastic to talk about their job and what they do and, and share advice and information with a colleague. Now I know this sounds like a question with an obvious answer, especially for any academic, or I should say experienced academic librarians that are attending. But we wanted to start with some this very basic question because we recognize that the uh, students that are here today may get little or no exposure to academic librarianship in their programs. In fact, uh, one of the reasons we're doing this is you know, we, there was a thread on ALA Connect not long ago, and it was related to a question about uh, doing a job search for an academic library position. And quite a few of our new to the profession colleagues shared that they had heard almost nothing about academic librarianship in their program let alone the differences between the different types of academic libraries and why you might be interested in working in one as opposed to another. And so as a result of that, uh, many folks were not even thinking about academic librarianship as a career track. So we thought, let's start with a, a very broad view of what academic librarianship is and why it might appeal to you. And I did see that we have some uh, students who are currently working in academic libraries, so they're already getting a taste of what it involves. Now, when I think of what is unique about any library sector, uh, K to 12, corporate, you know, whatever it might be, you know, I tend to think of it in terms of community. You know, every type of library has a unique community. And in academic librarianship, your community is most likely to be faculty and students. But you also have alumni, staff members, uh, local neighbors. Uh, literally anyone uh, could be a part of the community if your institution is public and it's open to all. Uh, at my institution, we constantly have visitors from you know, all across the world coming here to do research, but also uh, folks from local schools. Uh, we have a huge variety of the type of people that come to our library. But the majority of the people that we work with are our faculty and our students and our alumni. Now increasingly, our students tend to be online and we may never see them on campus. It's the community members who give each academic institution, and there are thousands in the United States, their unique quality. And you may be open to working with any and all of these different types of communities. Or you might want to work in a certain type of environment, which brings us to the different types of institutions. And I, and I should say there's no hard and fast rules these, day, these days with respect to students and instructors. Um, you know, you'll more likely find the traditional 18 to 22 year olds at a four year liberal arts college, while you might encounter more adult non-traditional learners at a community college. But I think we're all experiencing a, a wide variety and a mix, particularly as we offer online programs that are open to folks everywhere. Now, academic institutions and their libraries tend to fall into the four basic categories that you see on the right of the screen there. Community, or junior, baccalaureate, or four-year, or liberal arts college. Uh, then you have your comprehensive research universities. These are often uh, regional uh, institutions. They are often public, but they can be private as well. And then you have your research doctoral institutions. And again, they can be public or private in nature. I think the, the point here, oh, and I should mention that uh, you can also categorize academic institutions by their size. And that may have some impact on your decisions about what kind of institution you want to work at. And that's the point here, that you want to be thinking about what your interests are, what appeals to you. Do you want to focus on teaching and learning, for example? Then you might prefer a four-year or a community college environment. Do you want to be in a highly diverse environment? Then you might want to be in an urban research university or a urban community college. 
do you want to be on the tenure track or not? That may have an impact on your decision as to what kind of position you want to apply for. So how do you go about making these kinds of decisions since you're not likely to hear about the difference between a job and all these different types of libraries? Again, that's where it can help to make visits to these different types of libraries, get to know some of the librarians, talk to them about the kind of work that they do, or you might get involved in a, in a local library network or your, you know, your regional ACRL chapter is also a good place to start getting to meet other librarians and getting to know them. Another way to look at uh, jobs in academic libraries are by the different roles that we play. And when we think about academic librarianship or when you hear about academic librarianship, you know, we often think about these kinds of images that you're seeing on the slide, you know, that traditional public service role where you're lecturing to a group of students as they hang on your every word when you're making a point about the difference between an and and a or a Boolean operator, or you're staffing the traditional reference desk while you're waiting for a student to come up and ask you that really important question where it's going to make a big difference for them. Or you're organizing uh, outreach and promotional events for your community. But there are many other roles that you can adopt in an academic librarian. But I think if I showed you a photo of our digital scholarship librarian you know, working on a text mining project, you, know, you might not find that as exciting as some of these types of images. But you really want to consider that there are many new and emerging opportunities for academic librarians. Uh, we have a lot of new types of jobs and titles, user experience librarian, open education resources specialist, assessment leader, metadata specialist, digitization librarian, scholarly communications, library, li library publishing librarian. All of these are worth exploring. There's so many uh, opportunities opening up in our academic libraries. But if you still would like to work in some of these more traditional roles, uh, they continue to be there as well. And when we talk about the role of the traditional liaison subject specialist librarian, and even those traditional silos between public, uh, public services and traditional services, there's quite a bit of boundary crossing going on. And on this slide, you see references to some of the different research projects going on related to the changing role of the library liaison. And what I see happening in academic libraries is that those traditional divisions be between public and technical services, you know, those tend to be breaking down and more of the work is crossing over so that we really need to uh, call on each other's zones of expertise to do our work. And even the traditional liaison role of uh, that expert who primarily does instruction, builds collections, and supports research is changing. And it's expanding and crossing these traditional boundaries. So a subject specialist liaison may now work on a functional team of specialists from across the library to support data research management services, or library publishing. So we tend to think of these traditional roles, but they are changing quite a bit. And there's a real blending and boundary crossing going on in our institutions. Or at least we're trying to evolve the roles in that way. We know there's a lot of questions and topics that could be covered in a session like this. And I share here some of the common questions that I get asked and that I see being asked on library discussion lists, particularly something like, do I need a second subject master's degree? And again, that can really depend on what it is that you want to do in the academic library world. So take note of some of these questions. If this, there's one or two here that you'd like us to give a shot at, uh, feel free to ask, but I'm going to go to Rachel now. I'll pass the ball to her, and Rachel, you can let me know if uh, you've seen any questions in the chat for us. I'm looking, and I don't see, oh, yeah, yep, 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 here we go. I have one from Heidi Gramlich-Bryson, 
uh, who said she'd like to hear about how public K-12 librarians are transitioning into academic library and becoming academic librarians. How does that work? Well, well, and we have also, I'd love to hear about obtaining a second subject master's, yep, and elaborating more on do you need that or not. That's coming from Nicole Almanza and from Megan Boland. Renee Bedard is very interested in the research requirements for academic librarians, including Publisher Parish. Alexander Agino would like to know more about second subject matters. This is Melanie. I will chime in uh, on the question about the second master's degree. That's highly institutionally specific. Uh, there are some institutions, and you'll see it in the job ad, uh, where, where it may be a requirement in order to get a, a tenure track uh, position. Um, and then there are other institutions like mine where we would list that as something more like a, a preference. Uh, it's not something that we would require or expect. And it's likely not necessarily going to be something that gets somebody the job or not, but it would be just one of many factors that we would weigh and consider. So you'll need to, to read that job ad carefully and see whether something like a second master's is uh, listed as a, as a requirement or more as a preference or even if it's mentioned at all. And uh, here's another question that's not on the list, I think is a really good one. And it's coming from uh, Courtney Kleftis and it's asking how do liaison librarians become more specialized if they're uh, given a department to be the liaison to if they're not an expert. And that, that's really relevant to me because when I took my first academic job, it was in a business library. And I was asked to be the liaison to the accounting department, and I didn't know anything about it. So I think in that situation, uh, going out and getting to meet the faculty, learning what research they do, what their interests are, can start to give you a better idea of where you need to develop your expertise. And then you go to conferences, you follow discussion lists, you find out who are the people that are the experts. And when you get a question, you'll, you ask them for help. So I think that's one of the great things about uh, our profession is that, you know, if you're not an expert, there's plenty of people who are, and you just work with them and you learn from them and over time you become an expert yourself. So I think we're ready to go to the next segment. But thanks for your great questions. Okay, so uh, this is Melanie again. So uh, this is a good lead in to thinking about how you can use the job ad to help you kind of determine whether um, a position is something that you might want to be interested in applying for, and even uh, what what you feel your uh, your chances of being a strong candidate might be, and uh, how you can position yourself um, effectively as a candidate. Um, one thing that makes this process complicated, as Stephen's already alluded to, from the candidate side of the table is that every institution will do things differently. And navigating the hiring process requires you to navigate each system, each organizational culture, as well as a set of individuals with their unique personalities and approaches. So I'm going to speak primarily as a representative of myself and my position, my system, and my culture. Um, and my hope here is that this will give you an insider's view into how things look from the other side of the table. Uh, from a hiring institution's point of view, and that will help you make sense of what you're experiencing and understand how to increase your chances of standing out and making it through the different stages of the process. I've tried to focus on those aspects of the process that you're likely to encounter in one way, shape, or form, uh, no matter where you're applying, though, of course, the specifics will vary. Uh, don't take what I'm going to say as the truth that applies everywhere. Just take it as my attempt uh, to make what's ordinarily invisible or opaque to you visible and transparent. Thanks. The job ad contains an important set of clues about how to position yourself as a candidate if you read it carefully. And if you understand a little bit about what went into creating it, 
and the choices that were being made on the hiring institutions uh, side of the table. Okay. We use the job ad to convey lots of different kinds of information and to tip you off about what kinds of information we're looking for from you before we've ever met you. And you can usually break a job ad into four components. Uh, they're not going to be conveniently labeled all the time in the ad itself, although sometimes, sometimes they are. Um, you may have to work a bit to identify them. Um, so I want to help you suss them out a little bit and understand how you can use the information in the job ad to your benefit. What I call facts and recitals uh, is just the most basic information that we have to put in, either because without it you wouldn't have any idea what the job is, uh, any, any ability to determine whether it's something you're interested in, you wouldn't know how to apply, or because we have requirements from our home institution. Um, you know, any academic library is going to be part of some bigger institution, some bigger system, and we don't necessarily have full control of everything that our home institution wants us to, uh, to consider and wants us to put into a job ad. Okay? And sometimes we even have, as in my case, an applicant tracking system that we use uh, to post our jobs, um, to, to collect CVs and applications, and that, that applicant tracking system has certain fields in it that are simply required for us to, to have information in. So what you're seeing reflected in the job ad uh, is going to be uh, a, a bunch of information that comes from different sources for different reasons. Okay? Um, we have institutional stakeholders such as Academic Affairs, the Office of Equal Opportunity, Opportunity. They sometimes require us to use certain terminology or include certain language in a posting. So the details that you're going to see in this facts and recitals uh, section or the facts and recitals that's just included and maybe woven throughout the whole job ad, those are going to be critical to helping you decide whether this is something you want to apply for. Um, for instance, um, if from my institution we post a job um, and it mentions that it's a tenure track or tenure line position. Uh, that means, first of all, you'll know right away that you're dealing with an institution where our librarians have faculty status and this is a faculty position. And that faculty position will come with some expectations of faculty such as research and publishing. And if that's not something you're interested in, this is the point where you may just quickly want to screen yourself out, as Stephen mentioned, and, and think that's, that's not the type of career I'm interested in, that's not the type of uh, focus I'm interested in having, so I'm going to, uh, to screen myself out and uh, spend my time applying for a position that better matches what I'm looking for. Okay? If, however, you are interested in this, you'll want to make sure to convey that in your cover letter so that we know that you understand uh, what type of position you're applying for and that you are, um, are that you're eager and interested in uh, doing that type of work. Okay? Another important detail will be any instructions for applying. Please read these carefully and follow them exactly. If you're asked to upload a CV, don't upload a resume. If you're asked to provide a list of three references, don't provide a list of eight. And I'm not saying that you know, to be picky. I'm saying it because the easier you can make it for us to review ma your materials um, in the way that we've asked for them, um, the, 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 the more likely we are to be able to focus on what's really most important about your application and not get distracted by oh, this person has so many left references listed, how are we possibly going to you know, sort that out and figure out which ones to contact? Okay. Um, another important thing to note is any information about the deadline or the timeline for applying. And this is where it gets highly variable. Um, I pulled up a few uh, job ads this morning that are recent, and I can see one from a what looks like a four-year college in West Virginia that says applications will be accepted until the position is filled. Preference will be given to applications received by March 1, 2019. How I'm interpreting that, uh, not knowing anything about this institution, I'm interpreting that to mean um, they'll take your application at any point 
um, as long as they're still, you know, in the hiring process. But if you apply before March 1, um, that's, that's where you have a, a greater chance of your application really being seen and reviewed. Um, March 1 looks to me like this institution's sort of initial date for determining who is our applicant pool that we're going to ask everybody to take a look at and that we're going to try to get our initial screening interview pool from. So applications that come in after that, um, there's not necessarily a guarantee if the pool is large enough, there's not necessarily a guarantee that um, your application would, would be reviewed. Now I can't speak for that school, but that's how it would work here at my institution. When we post what we call a full consideration date, um, you can kind of go by that date to know, um, am I going to be looked at in that very first pool of applicants? Uh, where everybody on the committee will screen my application, or um, am I going to be someone coming in after that date where there's just not a guarantee, okay? So um, you'll need to decide as the candidate, given that type of information, whether you want to go ahead and apply. If you contact me, uh, if we've posted a full consideration date of say May 1, um, and it's June, and we're still accepting applications, if you contact me and say, should I bother applying for this? Are you still looking at applications? I'm going to say, yes, apply. I'll never tell somebody not to apply for a job. Um, and I never know what's going to happen in a search. Um, so you'll need to be the one to decide whether it's worth your time and effort to apply for a position based in part on kind of where, where you think you might fall in the pool of people that, we're, that they're looking at based on what they've published as their deadlines and their timelines and such. Okay. Okay. The, the job description or job summary as it's sometimes called, um, what we're doing with that is we are trying to attract you to the job itself. Um, we're trying to explain from our point of view why we think this is something you might be interested in, uh, how it contributes to the goals of our institution, what you'd actually be doing. And this is what we have the most control over. This is where we have the most ability to write what we want to write. Um, so that is going to uh, tip you off a lot about um, what we're hoping to see in your cover letter. Okay? So we're giving you information here about the work you'd be doing and how you'd be contributing, trying to make it sound appealing, while also giving you what what I would call a realistic job preview, helping you match up the way we see our needs and priorities with what you know your skills and interests are. We're expecting to see some evidence of this match in your cover letter. We want to know that you read the job description and can see yourself in it and that you're applying for this specific position because it appeals to you in some way. Okay. Then there'll be a section uh, regarding qualifications. Um, and they'll typically be listed and broken down as like required or minimum or preferred or maybe desired. Um, these qualifications, uh, probably at any institution, certainly at mine, are going to correlate strongly to our search criteria, which at my institution we've determined in advance of reviewing applications. We determine our search criteria in advance to minimize the potential for bias in the hiring process. We want to evaluate everyone by the same criteria and those criteria need to be highly relevant to the job. Uh, we use these criteria at every stage of the process, but they're particularly important for you to be mindful of early on, when all we have to go on are just the materials that you send us. We're going to screen applications based on these qualifications, and our required or minimum qualifications determine, uh, to some extent, who we can and must interview. Meaning, if we say that two years of relevant experience is required, we can't really interview someone with no relevant experience while skipping over someone who does have those two years. Um, there, there's just not a way that we can justify that in a fair and open recruitment process. Um, we're in a legal realm here when we're doing hiring, and that's always one of the things that's it's not even in the back of my mind, it's one of the things at the very front of my mind. I want to protect people's rights. Uh, I want to protect you know, the institution, and I need to make sure that our hiring process can stand up to some pretty heavy scrutiny if, if needed. So um, if, if you meet the required qualifications, you'll need to make sure that we can see that in your application materials. Okay? Don't assume people will see the connection 
between your experience and these required qualifications that we've listed. Don't assume technical or subject matter expertise from a search committee. Um, you know, you, you don't need to have all or even any of the preferred qualifications, um, but if we have 25 applicants who meet the minimums, we've got to have a way to narrow that down to a manageable number that we can interview. So the preferred qualifications will help us screen further when we have a particularly large and well-qualified pool. Um, and this won't necessarily hold true in all situations, but generally the preferred qualifications are often listed in uh, order of importance. Um, that's just like a natural way that people would, would write and prepare a job posting. So the first ones that we mention are probably the ones that are most relevant to us and the ones that will most help you stand out in the pool. So help us translate uh, your past experience into uh, what our qualifications say. Um, and don't think that you've got to have every single qualification listed, um, but make sure that you're helping us see that connection really, really clearly. And then finally, in what I call the About Us section, we're trying to attract you to our organization or location and trying to give you a sense of our culture and what it would be like to work and live here. We're going to tell you the things that we think make us an employer of choice, any particularly attractive benefits we offer, and also things uh, we think you might like to know about our community, as Stephen mentioned. Um, if something in particular about our institution, our culture, our community attracts you to us, we want to hear about it. Um, now, you probably shouldn't write your whole cover letter about how much you love the mountains and want to learn to ski, but if you're applying for a job here at the University of Utah and uh, would be relocating to Salt Lake City, um, believe me, we'd love to know that you could see yourself here uh, for whatever reason you may have. Okay? Um, another thing that we're doing uh, in this section is tipping you off about some things you might want to re research and reflect back to us. If we link to our strategic plan, which we always do at my institution, that's a strong clue that we want you to read it and make some connection to it. Um, we're not looking for flattery. We're looking for you to show that you understand what we're about and that you see yourself contributing to our mission, our goals, and our campus community. So in this next session, Stephen is going to walk you through a little bit more specifically um, some of the aspects that are important for actually applying for the job once you've thought about whether the job is something you're interested in, whether there's a good match between the job and, and, and you, um, and now you're moving to the stage of getting ready to uh, throw your hat into the ring. So I'll bat the ball over to Stephen. Okay, thanks, Melanie. And the, the, I really appreciate all the great questions that you're keeping you're uh, keeping to send in. And some of the questions that you all were asking, Melanie was actually answering those questions when she was covering those different topics. And I like the question that just came in about, uh, you know, how long should a cover letter be? And uh, I was going to mention that uh, usually like one to two pages. But I'll mention we got uh, a really good applicant for a position here. And their cover letter was four and a half pages long, and they were really just replicating a lot of the information that was in their CV. So you really don't want to you know, have something quite that long, and you should sort of do a self-check and ask yourself, if it's that long, what are you putting in there? You know, I'm sure we all have our uh, examples of what not to do. So you, as Melanie was saying, if you've honed in on a position and you're ready to apply, uh, here's a couple of things you might want to keep in mind, one of which uh, is your resume or uh, CV. So I did this search on the most creative resumes. I wanted to see what kind of things would come up, and there is no question that there are some truly creative uh, resume types out there, and I think you can find plenty of examples. And while these kind of uh, resumes would no doubt get a lot of attention, I think you probably want to go for something a little bit less creative for a library position. Now, that doesn't mean you still can't come up with ways to draw attention to your accomplishments, though. And I think there's a lot of great models and examples out there uh, that you might follow. 
Now, everyone is going to have their own opinion about resumes and CVs and when it comes to uh, design and layout and models and so on. And some people like lots of details. Some like certain types of information in a certain order. Uh, some just want the basics. Now, whatever appeals to you, that could be the best option. But I like to follow the advice of Dieter Rand, the designer of some of the world's most well-designed products of all time. And he basically says, uh, keep it simple. Don't overdo it with flashy elements. Uh, make it easy to read. Uh, digest the information. See the highlights. Oh, people are expecting to see certain kinds of information, your education, your recent experience, uh, presentations, papers you may have written, honors. And so they can all be laid out in a very logical uh, design to make it easy to see what needs to be seen. And again, the more design elements you throw in there, the more confusing it could be to look at. Now, I looked at a lot of different resumes trying to think, oh yeah, what's a good example to show? So I thought, I'll just show my own. I'm not suggesting that what I've come up with is a paragon of excellence by any means, but it, again, it follows just keep it basic, keep it simple, and try to provide the kinds of information that I know employers would expect to want to know about me. And uh, when I uh, needed some help. I wasn't sure quite what to do. I did get some help from uh, colleagues. I got together with a resume coach. That may be worthwhile if you want to invest in that. Uh, so you'll have a good model that you can keep building on through the years. And Melanie was just talking about cover letters, and we had that question about how long they should be. Uh, and I think this is what you don't want to happen to your cover letter. And this does happen in search communities where you know people will really pick them apart and find all the mistakes and typos that you've made. So you you can't underestimate the importance of proofreading, even things like making sure you've got the name of the institution, because a lot of us, if you're applying for a lot of jobs, you use the same cover letter over again. And of course, you want to um, adapt it, as Melanie was saying, to the type of position. And you know, But in general, uh, make it specific to the position that you're applying for. You know, keep in mind the nature of the institution. The same cover letter may not work for a research university as it will for a four-year or a community college. I like to see cover letters, and I know they go well when people demonstrate their enthusiasm and their curiosity. They demonstrate that they've spent a little bit of time looking at your website. They know a little bit about what's happening at your institution. Like We're building a brand new library at Temple University Libraries, and uh, we had a position in the you would think someone would mention that. Like, I'm really excited about your new library, and I, I think this is going to be a great opportunity. No mention of it whatsoever. So spend some time to learn a little bit about the institution and kind of add some of that information in. So again, you have lots of choices in design and style. And I think keep it simple. And again, I made the point about not having a cover letter that's too long. That's, and it just replicates information that's in your CV or your resume. And I think there was a question about uh, what's the difference between a resume and a, a cover letter. Um, I think you know resumes tend to be uh, cover letters. I would, I mean, curriculum vitae tend to be more uh, common in academia. And people may ask, how long should that be? And yeah, for a resume, for non-academic, you are often recommended to keep it to a, a page to two pages. But it's not uncommon for us to get um, CVs that go on for quite a few pages because it's OK to list your professional accomplishments, your continuing education, uh, those sort of things. So I'd be a little bit less concerned about length there. And Melanie also mentioned uh, references. Uh, I'll just say that uh, you probably 
need to know a little bit more about what they're asking for in that particular position? You know, should you put them in your uh, CV or your cover letter? Personally, I do put my references in my CV. I know they're there. I don't have to worry about getting them in response to a request from a potential employer. Uh, some job ads will flat out state that you need to include you know, a certain number of references. Uh, some may even ask you to submit actual letters of references from your, your colleagues. Uh, so do whatever is requested. But if it's left open, uh, feel free not to do anything and just wait to the point in the process where you are asked to provide them. Sometimes we don't ask someone for their references until you know, they're our actual number one pick for the position, and then we will ask for the references. Um, now, I would recommend having at least one reference that is a former supervisor. I think it's all right to have a current or a past coworker or someone you worked with on a professional committee, but I would always prefer either a current or a former supervisor. And I know a lot of times you don't want to give your current supervisor because you don't want them to be contacted about you applying for some other position, and that's totally understandable. But I'm even fine with talking to a former supervisor from a non-librarian position. I really want to hear from someone that supervised you at some point in your career. And you can also consider things like chairs of professional associations if you've served on committees. I think that can all work to your advantage too. So whatever you're doing, always try to do the best job possible so that you have folks that you can lean on when it's time to get those references. And again, I know we've got a lot of questions coming in. Uh, here are some other kinds of common questions that uh, people tend to ask about. Uh, their CV or their cover letter, references, all those sorts of things. But we'll just take a moment here. Uh, I know a lot of questions have been coming in, but Rachel, if you want to let Melanie and I know if there's a particular one that we should try to answer now, that'd be great. You know, Stephen, I'm glad you asked because one that has come up and then was seconded a couple of times is what about the folks who are coming in from a, another career? That they, you know, they had gone to college, they had a career, they came back to graduate school to do library work. And how do they, how do they tr talk about that prior experience? You know, that's kind of relevant. I, I, that was my actual experience. I started out in special libraries. I was working in a one-person special library. And I, I, like a lot of the folks who may be here today, I really didn't hear anything about academic libraries. I really didn't know anything about them. But then I got involved in my local uh, library chapter, and I got to know academic librarians, and I really got interested in the educational aspects of the kind of work that they do, and I really could see myself not only helping people to do research, but teaching them how to do that. And it literally took me two years to get uh, the kind of training and uh, second subject knowledge that I needed to be a better candidate. And for some folks, you might want to you know, focus on what's the area that I want to work in and start building some expertise there. Uh, so for me, the transition was I wanted to be a business librarian, and I got a position in a consulting firm where I wasn't even really working as a librarian. I was just working with consultants, doing online searching, you know, learning the business jargon, answering questions, and getting the kind of experience that um, even if I didn't have that second degree, I, I had the subject knowledge. So, you know, as far as making the transition from public or school, I think that's probably where I'd start trying to figure out where I want to focus as far as developing subject expertise, and then I might need to uh, take workshops. Uh, there are those kinds of continuing education opportunities out there, start building up my subject skill, and again, network with uh, people in, in the community that could help put you in touch or give you further advice. And, and if I can chime in on this, um, a couple of things, you know, this, this also relates to the question about like, how, if, what about if I had time off in my career track? For me, and again, I'm just speaking kind of for myself and how we do things at my institution, but I think a lot of um, folks would, would agree with this. Um, I think it's okay to just address those things, you know, somewhat directly uh, and, and acknowledge in the cover letter, 
you know, I, uh, I'm coming from most of my experiences in this other industry, this under, other field, um, and I feel that it can translate to the qualifications for the position in this way. Just make that explicit to us. We're going to have to try to figure that out ourselves anyway. So if you could help us do that a little bit, we'd appreciate it. Um, or the other thing, and, and I got this uh, from uh, my colleague Catherine Sainer, who's an AUL here at, at my library, but who's currently the interim director at our Eccles Health Sciences Library um, and has a background in uh, health sciences librarianship. I asked her about, you know, is there any difference uh, if people want to go kind of the health sciences route? Um, and one thing she pointed out is you don't necessarily have to have like a, a STEM degree, a health-related background or degree to work in like a health sciences library, library. But what you need to do is, again, make it explicit how your past experience and other qualifications will qualify you for the work and how you might plan to address any gaps in your experience or in your knowledge. Um, particularly around those things that might be, they might seem less important in the job ad, you know, they might be listed as preferences or desired, but if you can, can kind of address that and say, you know, I realize I, I haven't had yet, yet had an opportunity um, to, um, to, you know, work with this particular type of software or work in this particular type of environment, and here's how I would, I would plan to address that. You might not be able to do that in the cover letter, but it is something you could talk about in an in interview if you're moved forward in the process. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and segue into that uh, section of our, um, of our presentation and talk about the interview process itself, again with the caveat that this looks very different in different institutional types and, and different settings. I'm going to tell you more about kind of what probably is the most intense <laughs> process, which is working, working through a, a large research university uh, library process. Um, and the, one of the things that you'll note is there's going to be a lot of different people involved in an in interviewing process. Um, at a large institution like mine, um, you know, we're going to have a search committee that will mostly be people from our library. Um, at smaller institutions, it might be a smaller committee, or there might actually be uh, faculty from other parts of the institution that they're relying on uh, to help them be part of that hiring committee. Um, sometimes there's students on hiring committees, so um, it's lots and lots of different people involved. And um, the committee is going to be doing um, a lot of different kinds of things for us. Um, and I think just an inevitable feature of this process, because of all the different people that are involved, Again, at a large institution, we've got lots of people involved, and so it takes time to coordinate all of them. At a smaller institution, there might be fewer people, but they're just doing more work. They have less time. Any one person does. So um, you're going to have to be prepared to wait once you've applied. And I want you to understand why you're waiting and what's going on behind the scenes. Um, at my institution, our average time to hire from the time a job is posted, so from the time that you could see the ad to the time that we've made a formal offer, that average time is 120 days, that's four months, that's a semester. Okay? And that's considered fast for a faculty position at my university. On the front end of that, we already spent three to four weeks just getting the job ready to post, writing up the ad, getting all of our approvals in place. And again, it takes so long because of all the people involved. Um, and a big part of that is the search committee. Using a search committee is a best practice. It helps us meet a lot of our goals. Um, it, it also makes it a challenge for you to know who your audience is when preparing your materials or interviewing. From my perspective, the benefits of a search committee outweigh any drawbacks. Different community members are going to have other types of expertise and perspectives that may give you a better chance than you'd otherwise have. Um, different committee members will help us reduce the impact of bias in the hiring process. Uh, by having more people evaluating applications and looking for those connections between the materials that you've sent us and what we need in the position. 
okay, um, we'll be able to better see the benefits of applicants coming from many different backgrounds if we have search committee members from many different backgrounds. And that's all helping us with our commitment to fair and open recruitment, our commitment to diversity and inclusion. And then having many people involved in helping to make this decision also helps us with our commitment to diversity and inclusion. Um, and we can ensure that somebody selected for the job is coming in um, ready to be included by people from across the institution. And that's going to be something that will be very important to you if you're the person selected. And then there's just a lot of work that we have to distribute. Um, uh, the search committee's work can be really labor intensive and really technical and complex. Um, so bear in mind that if you're selected for an interview before you've even talked to anyone, we're weeks and weeks and maybe months into this process. And we've committed a lot of time and effort to getting to this point. And I've listed some of the things search committees are often responsible to for, which may not be identical in every institution. And in my institution, they're not actually responsible for all of these things. Um, but my point is just that this group of people is working hard to create a rigorous process that's also as good of an experience for you as we can make it. Um, and the, the goal is for the committee to help evaluate those applications that are coming through just to get us through a screening interview. Um, this is where you're most likely to first encounter the committee, is in a screening interview that's likely to be over phone or by Skype. It'll be pretty short, pretty straightforward, and pretty scripted. Because um, what we're trying to do, we're not trying to decide who gets the job at this point. We're using this to determine who we want to advance to the next stage. Um, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible, so we're going to, to screen more people rather than fewer. So we just need to be mindful of our time commitment there. Um, we're going to use a script so that we ask everyone the same questions because we want to evaluate everyone fairly and reduce bias. So this interview can be a little awkward for everyone. It's just not a natural organic process. We know that, and we don't expect you to perform perfectly. We just want substantive answers. Now, I encourage our search committees to send questions in advance to make the best use of time and put applicants at ease and let them perform at their best, but I'm not sure how common that is. Uh, some things to be prepared for are questions that speak to what's in the job ad, and be prepared to tell a story that addresses some of the less technical things that are referenced prominently in the job ad. For instance, in one that I looked at this morning, um, it, said, it talks a lot about creative problem solving. Um, so that's a, a clue that you might get a question in a screening interview that asks you to you know, tell us about a time when you solved a problem creatively. Okay? Um, because a committee can't necessarily tell anything about your ability to do that or about your interpersonal skills just from your written materials. Um, so they're going to rely on an example that you provide. Uh, one just kind of tip that I want to point out as well is if you're doing this via Skype, you've got to think about how you're going to look to the committee. For one, you're likely to be on a big screen in a conference room. Your face is going to be huge. So you want to back away from the camera. You want to frame your shot, and you want to have as neutral background as possible. And you want to dress professionally for the interview and try to, you know, if you've got to do this from home, minimize distractions that might uh, come into play um, and just be mindful of, you know, a group of strangers who don't know you seeing you through this meeting for the first time. Okay? Now, a lot of these interviews will end with a question that invites questions from you. Um, so have these prepared and it's best if they're things you're genuinely curious about that are related to the job. This isn't the best time to ask about things like salary and benefits. It's the time to show that you're interested in learning more about the job and about the institution. Okay. The in-person visit, um, at, at a smaller institution such as a community college, I heard from one of my community college colleagues that um, their in-person interviews, they tend to look more like how, how a staff interview looks like in my library. Uh, where it might just be as short as an hour. Um, it's not going to involve all the pieces that I've listed up here. It's not going to include a lot of things like you know, travel and meals and hotel stays. So it is important to understand uh, by institutional type how this might look a little bit different. Okay? Um, 
the in-person interview uh, is, you know, you, if you've never done one of these, you're going to want to talk to someone who has. Talk to people who've done in-person interviews at the type of institution that you've been invited to. Um, in a large research university environment, this is going to last one to two days. And it's going to involve meeting lots of people and being kind of shuttled around from place to place. It's not because we're trying to exhaust you. Um, it's because we're trying to provide lots of opportunities for all of us to learn more about each other, including for you to learn about us. Um, so you'll likely meet with the search committee for another round of scripted questioning, and then with other groups or individuals in the library and on campus. You should get an agenda ahead of time that lays all this out for you if it's as complicated as, as the way that we do it. Um, but if you're unsure at any point of what's going on, who you're meeting with, whether it's more informal, uh, more formal, or if there's just anything that you're not understanding here, it's okay to ask. Uh, remember that there's real people on our side of the table, and we, we understand that this is complicated, it's confusing, it's tiring, and that the stakes are high. So I think whoever you're coordinating with, whether it's somebody more in an HR role like me or a search committee chair, um, they want you to do well. Um, and they want it to make this um, as you know, simple for you as, as possible. Don't be afraid to ask questions about what you can expect or about what's going on in, in any given moment. You will typically be asked to give a presentation on a topic that you were sent ahead of time. Um, and again, that's going to vary vastly as to what the topic is and what they're expecting. Um, so whatever you were sent ahead of time, again, you know, read the instructions carefully. Um, assume a general, not expert audience, um, and uh, get the timing right. If you're asked to give a 20-minute presentation, don't have it be 10 minutes, don't have it be 30 minutes. Um, yes, at, a, at an institution like mine, um, we, we will cover your, your travel, and we will communicate very clearly with you about exactly what we're covering, how we're going to reimburse this. I mean, I have a form that, that we send everybody that lays this out. Um, so um, we don't want anybody to be unpleasantly surprised by, by that aspect of things. I think, again, at most larger institutions, you can expect that the basic travel expenses, your airfare, ground transportation, hotel for one or two nights, um, and some meals uh, are, are going to be reimbursed. But again, ask about that. We don't typically, like we don't reimburse rental cars um, unless somebody uh, requires one for a particular reason. Um, so uh, if anything isn't clear to you or if people haven't given you information that you need up front, don't be afraid to ask. Okay. Okay. And then remember that this is a two-way street. We want you to be engaged. Uh, through this whole experience, we want you to ask questions that show that you're reflecting and taking things seriously, and we want you to choose us as rigorously as we are choosing you. So the kinds of things that you want to be just thinking about are the job itself, the organizational culture, and then again, just the, the geographic location and the community. Okay. Once we get through our in-person interviews, um, there's going to be more waiting, uh, and that's because we still have, um, in my library, we, this is four to six weeks. What's on this slide takes us, on average, four to six weeks to do. Um, so this will be invisible to you, but very time-consuming and rigorous for us. Um, we haven't forgotten you, but we're not in full control of all of this process. Um, we're often the ones waiting for other people to give information back to us. So I know we're almost up against the hour here. Um, so I want to uh, bat the ball back to Rachel. Hello, thank you. We've got so many interesting questions, um, but we are also running so closely on time. Um, we um, Some of the questions I want to actually just shout out because I think they're probably um, working for several of you. There were questions about what should I bring on my on my interview day? You know, it's a long day. What kind of bags should I bring? Uh, don't bring anything new. You know, don't go out and buy new stuff for this. You have you have good stuff. Don't worry. Um, what kind of talks are they going to ask me to do? How do I get those travel funds? Many, many different questions. And I think we've answered a lot of them there in the chat. Um, we have um, 
just a little bit time left. Um, we were going to do a section on negotiation. Um, Melanie, do you think that there is like a thing that we should talk about that's like a one thing that we should say about negotiation? Maybe not. Okay. Well, what I think we will do then is let's see if we can move forward to. I'm sorry. Oh, Melanie, are you there? Sorry, I hit the wrong button. No, no. The, the one, the one thing I would say about negotiation is just understand that there's limitations on our side of the table, um, and um, we we have to be mindful that I, I can't have a, a system here where people are compensated on the basis of how well they negotiated when a job offer was made. That's not an equitable system. So a lot of what we're doing on our side of the table, we're definitely, you know, we want to get our, our top candidate here, but we've just got to be mindful of a lot of other uh, limitations that we have, budget-wise, policy-wise, and equity-wise. Thank you for that. Now, um, I am going to, because we are just about to disconnect, I do want to mention that we are going to attach with this a series of uh, resources that we think will help you, um, including some websites that we think would be useful, the Ask a Manager website, which is a great um, and fun read if you have a chance. Um, there are several articles in the Chronicle of Higher Ed that you may find, including The Professor is In, which is about the first round interviews versus the campus visit. Um, and then we have some additional resources that we're going to send you out as well, some articles that we've pulled together and some blog posts that we hope will cover some of this as well. Um, as we said, this is the start of what we hope to be a series. Um, of other webinars and where we can delve more into this information because we know that this is it, it's tough. It was tough for us, and we know it, it, it feels tough for you, uh, but it's a doable thing. We are also, um, and I should add, when we close out this recording today, um, as Aloha said earlier, we will be sending a link out to this sometime next week. And with that, we will also be sending out an evaluation so that we can kind of find out what your, um, one, how you felt about this particular um, session and what you hope to see in future sessions as well. Um, with that, since we are just over the 1 o'clock mark, we do need to disconnect at this time. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today and to please reach out with your questions. We're all happy to discuss them with you. Thank you so much for your time today. <laughs>